The west wind reigns over the seas surrounding the coasts of these kingdoms, and from the gateways of the channels, from promontories as if from watchtowers, from estuaries of rivers as if from postern gates, from passageways, inlets, straits, firths. The garrison of the isle and the crews of ships going and returning look to the westward to judge by the varied splendours of his sunset mantle the mood of that arbitrary ruler. The end of the day is the time to gaze at the kingly face of the westerly weather, who is the arbiter of ships' destinies. Benignant and splendid, or splendid and sinister, the western sky reflects the hidden purposes of the royal mind. Clothed in a mantle of dazzling gold, or draped in rags of black clouds like a beggar, the might of the westerly wind sits enthroned upon the western horizon with the whole North Atlantic as a footstool for his feet, and the first twinkling stars make a diadem for his brow. Then the seamen, attentive courtiers of the weather, think of regulating the conduct of their ships by the mood of the master. The west wind is too great a king to be a dissembler. He is no calculator plotting deep schemes in a sombre heart. He is too strong for small artifices. There is passion in all his moods, even in the soft mood of his serene days, in the grace of his blue sky, whose immense and unfathomable tenderness reflected in the mirror of the sea embraces, possesses, lulls to sleep the ships with white sails. He is all things to all oceans. He is like a poet seated upon a throne, magnificent, simple, barbarous, pensive, generous, impulsive, changeable, unfathomable. But when you understand him, always the same. Some of his sunsets are like pageants devised for the delight of the multitude, when all the gems of the royal treasure house are displayed above the sea. Others are like the opening of his royal confidence, tinged with thoughts of sadness and compassion in a melancholy splendour, meditating upon the short-lived peace of the waters. And I have seen him put the pent-up anger of his heart into the aspect of the inaccessible sun, and cause it to glare fiercely like the eye of an implacable autocrat out of a pale and frightened sky. He is the warlord who sends his battalions of Atlantic rollers to the assault of our seaboard. The compelling voice of the west wind musters up to his service all the might of the ocean. At the bidding of the west wind there arises a great commotion in the sky above these islands, and a great rush of waters falls upon our shores. The sky of the westerly weather is full of flying clouds, of great big white clouds coming thicker and thicker till they seem to stand welded into a solid canopy, upon whose grey face the lower rack of the gale, thin, black and angry looking, flies past with vertiginous speed. Denser and denser grows this dome of vapours, descending lower and lower upon the sea, narrowing the horizon around the ship. And the characteristic aspect of westerly weather, the thick, grey, smoky and sinister tone sets in, circumscribing the view of the men, drenching their bodies, oppressing their souls, taking their breath away with booming gusts, deafening, blinding, driving, rushing them onwards in a swaying ship towards our coasts, lost in mists and rain. The caprice of the winds, like the wilfulness of men, is fraught with the disastrous consequences of self-indulgence. Long anger, the sense of his uncontrolled power, spoils the frank and generous nature of the west wind. It is as if his heart were corrupted by a malevolent and brooding rancour. He devastates his own kingdom in the wantonness of his force. Southwest is the quarter of the heavens where he presents his darkened brow. He breathes his rage in terrific squalls and overwhelms his realm with an inexhaustible welter of clouds. 
He strews the seeds of anxiety upon the decks of scudding ships, makes the foam-stripped ocean look old, and sprinkles with grey hairs the heads of shipmasters in the homeward-bound ships running for the channel. The westerly wind asserting his sway from the southwest quarter is often like a monarch gone mad, driving forth with wild imprecations the most faithful of his courtiers to shipwreck, disaster and death. The southwesterly weather is the thick weather par excellence. It is not the thickness of the fog, it is rather a contraction of the horizon a mysterious veiling of the shores, with clouds that seem to make a low-vaulted dungeon around the running ship. It is not blindness, it is a shortening of the sight. The west wind does not say to the seaman, you shall be blind. It restricts merely the range of his vision and raises the dread of land within his breast. It makes of him a man robbed of half his force, of half his efficiency. Many times in my life, standing in long sea boots and streaming oilskins at the elbow of my commander on the poop of a homeward bound ship making for the channel and gazing ahead into the grey and tormented waste, I have heard a weary sigh shape itself into a studiously casual comment. Can't see very far in this weather. And have made answer in the same low, perfunctory tone. No, sir. It would be merely the instinctive voicing of an ever-present thought associated closely with the consciousness of the land somewhere ahead and of the great speed of the ship. Fair wind, fair wind, who would dare to grumble at a fair wind? It was a favour of the Western King who rules masterfully the North Atlantic from the latitude of the Azores to the latitude of Cape Farewell. A famous shove, this to end a good passage with, and yet, somehow, one could not muster upon one's lips the smile of a courtier's gratitude. This favour was dispensed to you from under an overbearing scowl, which is the true expression of the great autocrat when he has made up his mind to give a battering to some ships and to hunt certain others home in one breadth of cruelty and benevolence, equally distracting. No, sir, can't see very far. Thus would the mate's voice repeat the thought of the master, both gazing ahead, while under their feet the ship rushes at some twelve knots in the direction of the lee shore, and only a couple of miles in front of her swinging and dripping jib boom, carried naked with an upward slant like a spear, a grey horizon closes the view with a multitude of waves surging upwards violently as if to strike at the stooping clouds. Awful and threatening scowls darken the face of the west wind in his clouded southwest mood, and from the king's throne hall in the western board stronger gusts reach you, like the fierce shouts of raving fury to which only the gloomy grandeur of the scene imparts a saving dignity. A shower pelts the deck and the sails of the ship as if flung with a scream by an angry hand. And when the night closes in, the night of a southwesterly gale, it seems more hopeless than the shade of Hades. The southwesterly mood of the great wind is a lightless mood, without sun, moon or stars, with no gleam of light but the phosphorant flashes of the great sheets of foam that, boiling up on each side of the ship, fling bluish gleams upon her dark and narrow hull, rolling as she runs, chased by enormous seas distracted in the tumult. There are some bad nights in the kingdom of the west wind for homeward-bound ships making for the channel, and the days of wrath dawn upon them colourless and vague, like the timid turning up of invisible lights upon the scene of a tyrannical and passionate outbreak awful in the monotony of its method and the increasing strength of its violence. It is the same wind, the same clouds, the same wildly racing seas, the same thick horizon around the ship. Only the wind is stronger, the clouds seem denser and more overwhelming, the waves appear to have grown bigger and more threatening during the night. 
the hours whose minutes are marked by the crash of the breaking seas slip by with the screaming, pelting squalls, overtaking the ship as she runs on and on with darkened canvas, with streaming spars and dripping ropes. The downpours thicken, preceding each shower a mysterious gloom, like the passage of a shadow above the firmament of grey clouds filters down upon the ship. Now and then the rain pours upon your head in streams as if from spouts. It seems as if your ship were going to be drowned before she sank, as if all atmosphere had turned to water. You gasp, you splutter, you are blinded and deafened, you are submerged, obliterated, dissolved, annihilated, streaming all over as if your limbs too had turned to water and every nerve on the alert, you watch for the clearing-up mood of the Western King, that shall come with a shift of wind as likely as not to whip up all three masts out of your ship in the twinkling of an eye.